Um, uh, well, let's see. 30 minutes in total, but we need some sort of time. Yeah, so 25 minutes total, meaning, meaning, meaning plus, plus 15 plus 10. 15 plus 10 would be the sort of time. Okay, so uh, uh, Martin, how do you say your last name? Susan. No, Shinisevsky. Okay, good. He's going to talk about measurement and use base conditions and Anderson localization. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, very glad to talk to you about this, uh, this topic here today. And uh, basically, let me first um, uh, introduce this uh, this idea of these measurement and use transitions, and then we will we will move forward from there. Uh, so. Basically, oh, it's working. There it is. Right. So, so the broad motivation uh, behind this measurement and these transitions is coming from really thinking about thermalization in quantum systems. And uh, the idea is the following. So normally, if you have, let's say, a closed quantum system, you may expect, maybe naively, that the system would not thermalize because it is um, just uh, uh, this, it evolves unitarily and therefore uh, you can very easily sort of revert back time. But actually, that's not exactly true uh, because what you need to look at is really uh, measurements that are local, right? So, with local measurements, which are available for experiments, uh, you can actually uh, see that the, terminal, that the system actually does thermalize. And uh, the broad idea is that uh, most of the systems uh, do indeed appear to undergo thermalization. And uh, let's say states which are prepared out of equilibrium at large times, they will tend to thermal states. And therefore, this is known as this, uh, as this eigenstate thermalization. And basically, uh, you expect that, for example, uh, the expectation values of observables, they will tend to uh, these values which are predicted by, let's say, micro, micro canonical Now, for our discussion here, uh, important part is that uh, in this scenario, the entanglement entropy usually gr grows extensively with the system size, or what is usually known as the volume. And in the recent decades uh, or, or two, there has been a huge interest in systems where basically you have uh, this, I can say, thermalization hypothesis is somehow broken. So these systems would be such as uh, maybe other localized systems or maybe some quantum scar systems, uh, where basically the entanglement entropy doesn't grow extensively, uh, it grows this area law, where, for example, memory of initial conditions may be retained forever. Uh, in some local observables which are available for local measurements. So that's that sort of the idea. Now, uh, you can already see that there is a distinction between uh, how the entanglement entropy grows between these two different scenarios. Right? And uh, basically, the idea behind these uh, measurement induced entanglement transitions, or general entanglement transitions, is that there is going to be a transition between how the entanglement entropy scales with the system size or grows in time. Right, so, um, so let me now move on to these specifically measurement induced entanglement transitions. And in there, basically, the idea is that we uh, force this entanglement transition, not let's say with uh, this order or some sort of a smart system. But uh, with this, um, with local measurements, and basically, in order to uh, to get these measurement induced entanglement transitions, you need two uh, competing processes, and one of these processes is going to uh, somehow increase the amount of entanglement. Usually, that process is a unitary evolution of some kind, and that's basically that process will favor the volume law entanglement entropy. On the other hand, you have these local measurements, and these local measurements will decrease entanglement in the system, and they will point, uh, favor the volume. So, and the hope is that basically, if you clash these two 
processes together, maybe change the, their, their uh, respective frequency, um, then, uh, then you will see some sort of a transition between one phase of the other. Now, of course, this existence of this transition is not very obvious because uh, you may think, oh, maybe, maybe it happens for any amount of, let's say, measurements uh, or so. But it turns out that in the recent uh, couple of years, there has been a lot of research into, into these systems. And it turns out that generically, this phase transition does, not, does indeed occur and occurs at a, a finite value of uh, uh, this measurement frequency. Yes. Does, does it still work if you put ancillary bits in so that you don't, in some sense, strictly speaking, project? At yes. All you measure? Yes. So, so the measurements, they can be projected, but they can also be weak. Uh, so you can, in some way, uh, uh, also have, have that happen with, with, with weak measurements, let's say. Uh, and the difference is that you may not change the frequency of these measurements, but maybe the strength of the measurements. And that, that sort of, uh, but the transition still occurs. By, by weak, you mean not collapsing the wave function, just having a, a qubit there that entangles with the system. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Very good. Okay. So, uh, okay, so as I said, this transition is shown to exist in various scenarios. So. Uh, that these measurements projected weak, discrete, or even continuous. And um, the unitary, uh, the unitaries can be how random, the clipper gates can be something like Hamiltonian time evolution operators. Uh, and either you can put uh, this unitary to be another kind of measurement, which is uh, no longer, let's, let's say, one side, but let's say two side XX measurements, right? where you also uh, increase the number of measurements. Yes. Are you saying that um, you can be all of them together at the same time? So that you randomly sample from all of them or each of them? Or uh, well, it, it depends on your protocol. So you, you set your protocol to be, let's say, uh, some of these phase first, for example, this first paper here, have specifically looked at uh, a clipper gates, a random clipper gates, and then with projected measurements. Uh, but then maybe uh, another paper maybe have looked at uh, how random gates plus, plus projected measurements. And then, yeah, there, there have been very various protocols which have looked into that and found this transition to exist. So that's, that's basically, yeah. So let, let me show you how the uh, a rough uh, uh, sketch of the phase diagram looks like. And this is importantly for uh, what I call interacting systems. For, so, so, so that would be, as I said, um, uh, either it, it would be these, uh, uh, these unitaries, which are random, Clifford, uh, or Hamiltonian time evolution operators of Hamiltonians, which are interactive. And that's, that, that's the idea. And the, the idea is that you basically have uh, volume law on one side, uh, area law on the other side. So this is what you would expect. And then in the middle, you have this critical point. Now, this critical point um, is quite important because it has um, a conformal symmetry. And uh, in that critical point, you have entanglement entropy, which scales logarithmically with the system space. And it basically can be shown to be described by this non unitary one plus one dimensional uh, conformal group. Right? So, for example, what you can do is you can extract an effective charge at this particular point uh, for, for a specific system, right? for a specific protocol. Now, as I mentioned, this is a phase diagram for an interacting system. And now we switch to a free Fermium case. Right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, uh, the, uh, the phase diagram looks actually quite different. Uh, very early papers looking at these preternal systems of measurements and concluded that there's actually no transition whatsoever uh, because they, there was an argument where basically this preternal system will not support any volume law. Uh, but actually, there is a transition. It's just that it doesn't occur from the volume law to the area law. It occurs from this extended critical phase, which uh, still has this logarithmic behavior. Kind of entropy 
to the area locals. And now this nature of this uh, of this point of this clinical point is, is completely different to what it was before. Um, okay, so now uh, what we can do is, for example, we can plot the um, effective central charge. This uh, this critical phase is still a um, a phase with conformal symmetry. Um, so what would you expect here uh, to, to to see is that uh, the effective central <coughs> charge would be somehow finite for the critical phase. It would be infinite for the volume law, uh, which is uh, just this zero point if you don't have any. And then it will be zero for the area. So that's that's sort of the problem. And now um, another thing is that at this critical this critical point um, is actually thought to be described by uh, uh, or lie in this uh, Brzezinski poster that Cowlitz universality class. And um, why do I say that it's thought to be? Well, because we have. Uh, uh, we have some analytical results for uh, a model of Dirac variance with measurements, which implies that there should be this, uh, this PKD transition. And we have a lot of numerical results uh, on free variance in different scenarios, which uh, show that, for example, the data, the numerical data that you can get collapses well with uh, uh, scanning predictions coming from the PKD. So there is a lot of evidence uh, that this is either in or very close to be good universal. <clears throat> okay, um, so so let me now move to what I wanted to discuss today, which is uh, the research that we've done, uh, which is basically we wanted to induce uh, in to that that scenario, we wanted to induce. A random uh, potential. Right? So, so in this case, what we were interested in is we wanted to see the interplay between Anderson localization and this idea of measurement induced transitions. Right? So, the model is going to be the following we, we will have this Fickerman Hamiltonian evolution of random potential under this continuous uh, homodyne monitoring. And uh, basically, just sort of, sort of to show you exactly how it is implemented. It is implemented as this stochastic standard equation, which basically describes what is known as a quantum state diffusion, and uh, basically describes uh, uh, this um, uh, this homodyne deflection, which is happening everywhere uh, uh, with certain, uh, let's say, uh, measurement strength. Right, and. Uh, to show you the results, which, uh, by the way, probably has been spoiled by the, by the abstract <laughs> to this stuff, um, uh, the phase diagram looks like this. So, um, as we would expect at a very small disorder of strength, uh, we basically recover what has been done before, uh, which is the critical point, uh, which I found uh, on the on two slides ago. Um, but now we also see other interesting things. So, for example, we see that the log of uh, uh, of this critical phase survives uh, uh, introduction of the disorder in the, in the system. <coughs> and that is, again, not so obvious because uh, that same uh, uh, critical phase does not survive introduction of, let's say, uh, interactions in the system. Right. Um, Okay, and now another thing that we can notice is that at a very low uh, amount of, of measurement strength, at zero measurement strength, you have just the Anderson Lockless model, right? And um, in some way, we have this, uh, this line here, which actually indicates that, uh, that this is an Anderson model. Uh, and basically, for that, we can see that the effective central charge is nearly zero everywhere, except for very small values of W, where basically our numerical results um, of system sizes that we use are too small to capture the, uh, the, the uh, localization maintenance system. Um, so, 
So basically what happens, which is quite interesting, is that as you start introducing a bit of measurements, so by that a bit, I mean that you put the measurement strength where it's say 0 0.02, and you see that the, um, that the behavior completely changes. And you see that there is uh, there is suddenly an appearance of this measurement induced entanglement transition, where you have um, the critical law uh, or a critical phase here, and then the area law on the other side. Okay? So you immediately, in some way, break the Anderson localization as soon as you introduce some amount of measurement. And uh, we can also see that, but by looking at um, connected correlation functions, uh, which basically show that uh, for pure Anderson localized model, uh, uh, you basically have these correlations decaying um, faster than algebraically, while um, as soon as you introduce a bit of measurements, you start seeing that in the in the critical phase, you see. Uh, correlations which decay algebraic. So that is a very good evidence that this uh, that this phase actually exists as soon as we introduce any amount of measurements. I'm sorry, so how do you do these simulations with like some sort of like tensor networks or like just exact diagonalization? Um, no, so for the for the three Fermion models, what you can do is you can represent uh, this your wave function as the Gaussian wave function. Uh, this uh, stochastic Schrodinger equation that I shown before, uh, that equation uh, preserves the oceanity of the wave function, um, and basically you can uh, you can then you're you're basically doing simulations uh, by uh, changing this um, basically matrix, which is uh, polynomial in the system. So it's uh, reasonably fast. So, so, so. <coughs> You may be able to what's the dashed white line in your face type uh, what, what, what? The dashed white. Oh, uh, so that's, uh, well, perhaps I should remove it, but basically <coughs> this is uh, a, an estimate coming from uh, where, of where the transition could be, um, uh, coming from the uh, central charge estimated through looking at half chain entanglement entropy. Uh, but the problem there is that uh, this this needs to be really um, collapsed well in order to, to actually get the transition point exactly where it is. The real transition point is the solid the real, line. Like, the okay. real transition right. point is the solid line, okay. Okay. which is estimated using uh, all these points here, which basically each of them is this uh, reasonably good method of estimating where the transition actually is. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, for the critical system that we get, uh, is this the non unified? Um, you mean so yeah. you are characterizing this by, by a central charge? That's this, yes, yes, yes. And you are assuming that you're saying that that's corresponds to a non unitary model, and non unitary one plus one, uh, uh, they conform out to it, yes, yeah. and, and you know, which, which kind of uh, Specific uh, model, like, I was expecting that the mm -hmm. was there. Uh, so in this case, well, we of course, as I said, we have uh, some analytical results which uh, which map this system to uh, some model which has this the phase transition, uh, but uh, we don't really know exactly what happens for let's say the model models. Just let's say okay. numerical predictions. So, so you don't also have uh, any idea of the scaling response for the correlations? Um, so the correlation uh, the correlation length here actually scales uh, with this um, has this slowly diverging. Uh, uh, it, it scales like this, right? So it doesn't really have like a, like a yeah number. five minutes left. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. So let me let me move but perhaps with that. Um, right. So another thing that we can see is that um, <clears throat> this BKT universality class that I was talking about is actually preserved if you go to find the sources. 
right? So for w equal to 0 0.5 and w equal to 1, you can actually collapse the data well with the uh, with the scalings uh, coming from uh, the DKT universality class, and uh, you can see that these um, these scale uh, collapse pretty well. And well, basically, you can say that yeah, it seems like that the DKT universality class is uh, is preserved. On the other hand, there's this uh, strange non-monotonic behavior here. Uh, which is quite interesting. And it seems like this is coming from the fact that uh, low disorder basically facilitates scrambling, right? And this is coming from another paper um, where we basically looked at uh, non monotonic, well, we found this non monotonic behavior, but for an interacting model with this order, right? And the idea is that basically the uh, scrambling that you get from um, uh, from, from looking at these fermion models is quite low and uh, spelling of entanglement is, is reasonably low so that uh, as you introduce a bit of disorder uh, that actually makes the, um, the, the, the matrices that you have to write your system look more like random matrices uh, which induce slightly more entanglement spread as the product. Uh, okay, so because I don't have too much time, maybe I will move on. And so another thing that we've asked was um, and whether the area law in different places of the space diagram uh, sort of is similar to each other. And basically what you find is that uh, if you look at autocorrelation functions, um, these autocorrelation functions will be constant for the Anderson model, but as soon as you introduce some amount of measurements, uh, these are the correlation functions decay. Uh, it, they may decay quite slowly, but they will uh, decay at long times. Um, and uh, that decay is even faster if you go to this corner there, which is uh, when you when you have quite a lot of measurements, uh, but let's say small disorder. Okay, so just to summarize all these ideas, uh, so what we basically find in this model of Anderson model of these measurements. Uh, we find that uh, we have uh, the critical uh, phase is, is something preserved uh, and it is robust under this order. Uh, the DKT universality class is again preserved if you introduce this disorder. Um, this disorder seems to also, if it is low, uh, it seems to facilitate entanglement spreading in the system. And another thing that we see is that Anderson localization is uh, broken as soon as you introduce uh, some amount of measurements. And as I mentioned just a slide ago, the other correlations um, seem to always decay if you introduce uh, some amount of measurements. So that's basically it. Thanks a lot for listening. Okay, time for some questions. So mm -hmm. these measurements seem to be driving it towards an area law, but yet starting from the area of localization, they drive it to a critical phase, which just seems very counterintuitive. Do you have a good explanation of why that is? Um, so, so we have a couple of uh, maybe thoughts about this, uh, on exactly what exactly happens here. But if you think about, uh, let's say, having a low disorder, and then driving that um, and, and being in the Anderson local X phase and introducing some measurements. Well, at low disorder, your orbitals, your localized orbitals, are, have quite large localization length, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as you introduce some disorder, uh, some, some measurements, um, that is going to, to completely change uh, this, um, how these orbitals look like. And in some way, uh, perhaps it is the case that uh, for flash just all the strength, these orbitals are sort of thin and localized enough not to change too much in the system. But while for, for low disorder, um, that seems not to be the case. Um, that's sort of maybe the intuitive idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine circumstances in which this type of transition occurs in a first order manner of the continuous? Hmm. 
not exactly sure. Okay, then I'll ask my question. Yes. Um, so, um, I dare not ask you about connection to the experiment, but let me try and put this in a physical language. Um, mm -hmm. You were telling me that if I had a one dimensional conductor and I started looking at it, uh, that the electrons would delocalize. Is that what you were telling me? That's what I, one dimensional just, uh, just well, it's all of one yes. dimensional conductors are automatically yeah. localized. Yes. Right? Yes. But I put in a little bit of measurement, and I don't know what that really means, but. Um, uh, so well, I'm probing it, uh, it will now become a metal. Uh, well, it will have... Let him answer first for you. But... <clears throat> mm. Right, so what it, what, what it really means experimentally is that you have these, uh, these homoback detections, right, which will sort of look at the experiments. Right. Uh, and, uh, well, first of all, you need a quite low random potential. Right. Sure, the, the fermions are localized, but uh, as soon as basically you will start doing the measurements, you, you, you will break it. And would, just to follow up, would phonons do that? Closed mm -hmm. system with phonons interacting with a disordered uh, 1D system. Would they do that? I'm not sure about that. And that's kind of a different system into which you're radiating information. Mm -hmm. How can that not be like adding ancillary qubits? <coughs> and therefore, wouldn't this be a prediction that phonons destroy localization in one dimension? It's not true, actually. But, mm. um, it actually uh, is true. It is true. Because basic localization is a result of interference. Yes. Mm. Phonons disrupt this interference. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But actually, this uh, specific what you were asking before, to take an insulator. Uh, I think it's the same as measurement, like actually, in the, some time ago, people have done this study, so maybe it should be subject to white light, mm -hmm. which is a random uh, electric field, mm -hmm. and it actually can turn, uh, at least it makes localization like much longer. I see. Turn very very okay, that's very nice. I didn't know that. Thank you. Well, I think mm -hmm. we should probably move on to the next speaker, but this is a great talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> And I think I need to next week. Hey. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.